Right. So Hesma. Um, Hesma is challenging both from a patient point of view. It's challenging from an allergy point of view in that uh, there's still controversy. Most um, respiratory physicians will tell you that allergy doesn't play a large role in their day-to-day -day work. Um, and uh, another point I took out of Kat Chang's lecture last week was that she's expecting and hoping for something she calls biomarkers. So more, much more sophisticated lab tests than we have currently, which you could run a panel of on, on patients with asthma. It will give you a binary sort of uh, answer as to whether that patient has phenotype A, B, C, D, or E. Um, of asthma, and that then will then be guidelines that you don't even have to think about. You just follow the guideline, and uh, phenotype C gets the following drug, and then the asthma goes away. So, um, to be honest, uh, I think there is a biomarker available already for atopic asthma, and that is IgE levels, you know, specific IgE. So that's where I'm coming from in my approach to asthma. I'm just going to tell you a story to, in this particular presentation. Um, about a patient I, I dealt with in Otrahonga. So I started working occasionally in Otrahonga in 2013, a year after I came back from, from Oz. And it was November, December, and I was just working occasional weeks. And this lady came in, um, Shirley. And my first impressions, I'll be honest with you, were really not good. Um, for a number of reasons, and I'll come, I'll come to those. I took a quick look at her notes, just to see what, was, what I could expect. She was a lady with asthma bronchiectasis, morbid obesity. I mean, she was up at, I think, 160 kilos. She was on CPAP. She had atrial fibrillation, mitral incompetence, hypertension, suffered from gout, and menorrhagia. She was 50, just 50, coming on 50. The, the uh, regular medications she was on, Spireva, Montelukasts, Ventolin, Symbicort, as you can expect, She'd been given loratadine. She was on dibigatran, digoxin, quinapril, atorvastatin, diltiazem for her cardiac uh, conditions. She was on allopurinol. She was on norethisterone for her menorrhagia. And most important, she was on prednisone and antibiotics. And I've put those in capitals. This lady was taking industrial quantities of prednisone, as prescribed. And I think if you totaled it up, you'd come to tens of grams of prednisone that this lady was consuming over the previous few years. The amount of augmentin and rupsithromycin that she was consuming was, yeah, just wrong. Now, part of my first impression when she walked in was a cold sort of feeling of dread. I, I looked at a woman who was dying. Right? She, was, she was that bad. She shuffled in, she could hardly breathe. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy dealing with dying patients. Um, she clearly also, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there was a social impression I got. This was a lady with um, you know, a hard upbringing and a hard life. You can tell that. She'd lived, she was raised tough and had lived rough. You could see that. Um, I, could, I could see that these drugs had caused iatrogenic effects in her. The obesity, the immunosuppression may be causing the bronchiectasis, the hypertension from all these steroids, the menorrhagia from all the steroids. She was clearly overdosed with most of what she was on. Um, and she came basically every week, a couple of days a week, 
it was a bad time for her. And she came needing Symbicort, needing steroids, needing antibiotics. And I didn't say no. I'd read the letters from the respiratory clinic. These, these are the things they'd been doing. And another sort of thing, I, part of the impression I had was, was that this was a hopeless case. You know, I was wasting my time. And slowly I got to know Shirley a bit better. And turned out she, she wasn't as rough as she looked. She was actually a pretty decent person. She was also a grandmother who had had two of her sons die. And she was looking after her, their children. So there was quite a, quite a family dependent on her. She was scared of dying, not so much for herself, but for who was going to look after all these people. And one day, I just kind of lost my temper with the whole situation. I said to Shirley, I remember saying it, I said, Shirley, this is not good enough. I didn't know quite what I was going to do, but it was not good enough. Yeah, so what, what were the challenges in dealing with, with this case? Uh, you know, as I've, I've, as I've told you, my attitude was certainly part of it. Um, a diagnosis. The last thing I could, th the, the one thing I could think of that hadn't been dealt with yet was allergy. Could there be an allergic component in all this mess? I think we should bring funding up near the top of the list. Shirley was on a wins benefit. Um, and I wanted her to go to the allergy clinic, get a skin prick test. It was going to cost her more than she could afford. Uh, I wrote letters to wins for her. They weren't interested. I wrote to the local Iwi Trust. Uh, she, didn't, she wasn't senior enough. I suspect she may not be in the right social group in Otrahonga. I won't say too much about her family. And finally, her son gave her $500. And she came to the allergy clinic, and we did testing on her. And the, um, the skin prick test wasn't very helpful. It, it was quite difficult to read, and there weren't strong positives there. So as I mentioned earlier, I thought, well, OK, second option, we'll do a rest here. And the rest came back with um, some reactions to dust mite and to grasses. And the only reactions on the skin prick test had not been dust mites and grasses. So I thought, okay, what the hell? And I thought, we can treat this woman, start treating her, desensitizing her to dust mites and grass. What can we lose? So the diagnosis was complicated. And I've noticed this before. Patients on very high doses of steroid, the skin prick test is not reliable. Now there was a challenge before we could start immunotherapy. One of the guidelines in immunotherapy is that you do not treat asthmatics that are, who are not controlled. And it was by no stretch of the imagination was this woman controlled. Um, I was prepared to take the risk, I suppose, but certainly Graham Curry, who owns the clinic that I work for, he wasn't prepared to, to break the rules like that. But um, as uh, spring and summer moved on, around about April, things did seem to sort of come under control a bit more. And at, at some point, I could convince myself and Graham that we could start immunotherapy on this lady. So we did. Um, I've put social uh, challenges there again, just to remind us. You know, this lady lived in a rental house, a state house, uh, limited transport options, lots of... Um, Lots of uh, responsibilities and commitments. And then, of course, there was the, there's the guidelines. Nowhere in the official asthma guidelines will you find anything um, to guide you in terms of treating allergy. So, how did things, um, how did things go? As I say, about April 2014, we started the desensitization. And 
she s reported about six months later that a Symbicort bottle was now lasting her two weeks instead of two days. About a year later, she was no longer short of breath when she walked into the office. She was a very conscientious patient. Like I say, she, she was keen not to die. Um, she paid us $10 a week, every week, out of her um, allowance. That went to the allergy clinic and it built up a bank fund, so there was never a problem paying for her allergens. About six months or a year later, she, she actually told me for the first time that she's got hay fever. She realized that she's got hay fever. That had disappeared into the whole mess. Her eyes, she says, they warn me when it's time for my next injection, because they get all sore and they weep. So two years later, she was going to the gym every day, loving it, uh, and the pool in Otrahonga. Um, and yeah, today she's just trucking along. I wouldn't say she's uh, recovered. She's still got bronchiectasis. She's still mortally afraid of um, colds, you know, winter colds. But she's alive. Um, another important factor was that we, uh, we got an iwi advocate in, uh, a funded iwi advocate in Rotorama. And this woman um, takes Maori with severe chronic conditions and advocates for them, goes to their house, does all the social kind of work. And this lady organized a load of metal for the driveway of this house. And I was quite chastened by that. Not in a million years would I think that she might need a load of metal on her driveway. The story was that the driveway had worn away so that there was this big dip next to the house where water collected. And, of course, the house was as moldy as it could be. So that problem was fixed by a load of metal. So some feedback. Yeah. Um, these are extracts from the many letters from the respiratory clinic that we got. July 2015, right, this is a year and a half after we started. I reviewed Shirley today. She has improved. The chap there at the clinic asked her what was going on. And she said, no, I'm going to the allergy clinic. He said, what, where, what? Yeah, she said, it was Dr. Becker. And he said, who, what? But he, was, he had the, the guts, the um, open-mindedness to say, well, something about this immunotherapy is working. She has used prednisone twice in 12 months, and her spirometry reveals mild airflow obstruction. And then a year and a bit later, Shirley's been very well since I saw her last. One course of Augmentin for, for two weeks since he'd seen her. She's not required any steroids. She's going to the gym five days a week, and her weight has dropped 30 kilos. Her chest reveals no crackle or wheeze. Spirometry has improved to back within normal limits. I think we will discharge her. Which was very, uh, what's the word? Rewarding for me. This is a little cartoon I made. I know there are no guidelines on using desensitization for asthma, but how many anecdotes does it take to change a light bulb? from the old to the new. So if you look up GINA, uh, the guidelines, the international guidelines on asthma, there's really very little there, except that every year there seems to be a little bit more about allergy. And my prediction is 10 years from now, it's going to be there in black and white and bold that in highly allergic people with atopic asthma, you should use desensitization. But as I say, the uh, specialists would not agree with me. To a man, they would not agree with me today. Now, did I miss? No, I didn't. Oh, um, how much time do I have? Oh, plenty. I've kind of in, um, in, um, intimated why I think this works. Uh, 
IgE is a biomarker for atopic asthma, which is one of the subtypes that are accepted. Uh, we know we can treat allergy with desensitization and cure it. So why can't we cure the chronic inflammation of asthma if it's due to atopy? So there's my, there's my position. The other very interesting thing I want to tell you about is a natural experiment which runs every now and again in South Australia. <clears throat> they have what they call thunderstorm asthma. Now, some of you may, have remem may remember back in December 2016, there was a night from hell in Adelaide, I think it was, where hundreds of patients called in terminal asthmatic attacks. Every single ambulance in the city was used. They were stacked up 10 deep at the EDs. There were eight deaths that night from asthma. And it was a, a dry thunderstorm, which happens down south of Australia. You get these dry, hot winds, thunder, and then it pours. But you get that thunder first and lightning. And the, the most amazing thing was that every single one of those deaths and severe asthmas were in people who were allergic to grass. And this experiment has put the, the final nail in the coffin for people who do not believe that allergy has anything to do with asthma. So what happens in a thunderstorm? The earth becomes highly negatively charged, right? Highly. Between the clouds and the earth, there are literally millions of volts of potential. Those electrons coat bits of dust, including bits of pollens on the ground. Negative charges, they repel each other. The pollen flies up into the air, although you can't see it. It also breaks open, the moisture in the air breaks open the pollen and releases the pollen granules inside the pollen grain, which are the actual things which go down into your bronchi, your alveoli and your bronchioles. The pollen grain is too big to do that. So these people, all of them grass allergic, were getting industrial doses of allergen and the disaster unfolded. So smaller ones happen fairly regularly in South, South Australia. And that brings me to fi my final slide, so the message. Is asthma a disease or a symptom? I see it as a symptom of allergy. So don't treat the asthma, treat the allergy. Treat the asthma in the meantime, obviously. There's an alternative to inhaled corticosteroids after inhaled corticosteroids after inhaled corticosteroids. If you're not, which is the third point. Oh, no, it's not the third point. If you're not succeeding, think that there may be another way out. And my last point is, even in severely affected patients, you may be able to make a difference. So that's a good, strong message, I do believe. Challenges or questions? <clears throat>